today I'm going to talk about the central limit theorem for the perimeter of the convex hull spanned by two independent random walks in a plane. Um, so consider a captivating real life problem where you have two, um, two beetles on a table, they are positioned in the same point and they start to move independently one from each other in, uh, in different directions. And one can ask, uh, what can maybe say about the area that these two beetles uh, describe uh, up to time n? And one possible consideration might be the convex hole spanned by these two trajectories. So this is the main um, uh, motivation. Why do we study this problem? Uh, so we introduced two, uh, sequ two sequences of independent identical distributed random vectors in R2, and we're going to denote by mu k the corresponding drift uh, vectors of these uh, uh, two sequences. And with these increments, we can define random walks that start from uh, zero, and below is presented the simulation up to time n is equal to five. And our, our main interpretation is the uh, limit behavior of this object here, which is the perimeter of the convex hull spanned by these two trajectories up to time n. And we can ask ourselves, uh, what is the limit behavior of that uh, random variables? So I'm gonna firstly state the results because they are the most interesting parts. And afterwards, we're gonna just uh, briefly sketch the outline of the, of the proof. So denote by theta k, the angle of the k drift vector, and denote with a theta, the unit vector in the direction of theta, and denote with uh, theta c, the angle such that projections of these two drift vectors are the same in that direction. And afterwards, we can define the, uh, this vector here, which is the unit vector orthogonal to this vector a theta c, such that these two vectors forms the right, right hand base for our plane R2. And the my main theorem is the following. Uh, the main theorem, theorem, uh, theorem one states that uh, the total deviation uh, of the perimeter can be described with, with this sum of uh, independent and equally uh, distributed random variables. So let's talk about the intuition behind this result. Uh, this theorem states basically that the total deviation can be approximately decomposed into three parts. The first part is this sum over here, which is uh, basically the deviation of the first walk projected on the, uh, of the drift vector of the first walk. The second part is an analogon of the uh, first walk, but just for the second walk. And the third part is the most interesting part, uh, is a total deviation that happens on the chord that connects these two most extreme points of the random walks that span the convex hull. Uh, but this chord can be approximated by the chord uh, that connects these two uh, drift, drift vectors at the ends uh, if we multiply it by n, and then we project it on the y uh, x axis. Okay, so what, uh, what did we do? We basically, our perimeter uh, decomposed into the three sides of a triangle because our convex hull is on a large scale, it's a triangle. Uh, and the next theorem that follows from the theorem one is the uh, variance asymptotics. Uh, it basically states that uh, variance of our object Ln is, uh, is a order N. There's a tip on my uh, presentation. Uh, this boundary here is not included. And the limit uh, is described by sigma squared, where sigma squared is basically the variance of the uh, single term that uh, appears in the theorem one in, in the sum over there. And finally, and the most interesting part is the central limit theorem, 
which uh, says that our object ln, the perimeter, approximately scaled appropriately, uh, behaves uh, like a, a standard normal distribution. Okay, we have some ass assumptions here. For example, the main assumption is that, okay, this is a standard assumption, but this assumption here is that these two drift vectors must be independent, or otherwise we can say that these two drift vectors have the full rank in the plane. So um, let's just uh, give the outline of the proof. Um, in the proof, I use two main techniques. The first technique is the marking a difference sequence. Uh, one can ask, what is that? So uh, to achieve the marking a difference sequence, um, we introduce the independent copies of our increments. And what do we do? We resample the eth increment of our walks. And therefore, we obtain the resampled walks. And we can consider once again the perimeter of the resample box. And we can uh, consider this uh, variable the d and y, which is basically the expected change of the perimeter if we are know the information at the time uh, y of the original walk. And this sequence here is basically the Martigal difference sequence. And it is stated in lemma one over here. The next technique is the Cauchy formula. Cauchy formula is uh, one beautiful formula from the convex analysis. Uh, what does it say? Uh, it says that our perimeter, ln, can be described with an integral. Which integral? You have to integrate uh, the parameterized range function, which is basically for angle theta is the difference between the maximal projection of, uh, of the considered object minus the minimal projection of the considered object. And if you integrate the function for all thetas between zero and pi, you will get the perimeter of, uh, of that convex object that you study. Uh, what do we study? We study the convex uh, hull of these two endpoints. And one of the main interests in, uh, in the analysis of this problem is the behavior of this function delta n y, uh, which tells you the, the change of the parameterized range function if you do the resampling. And this lemma here is very technical. It basically says that um, for any theta that you choose, this variable is uh, integrable. Next. Um, we're going to introduce some uh, interesting uh, variables. Uh, for example, this J underline and J overline and K uh, tells you the time where the minimal, minimum projection and the maximum projection occur. Okay, J uh, represent, uh, represents the time. And to simplify the problem a little bit, we can introduce the polar expression of these uh, drift factors. And without, without the loss of generality, uh, we can assume that theta one and theta two, which are the angles of the drift factors of these two walks, uh, are in the upper half plane. And uh, we can en ensure that the projection of the drift factors on the y-axis are equal. Okay, this is because the uh, convex call is invariant under rotations and uh, reflections. And after doing it, we are left with two possible situations. The first situation is that the, the first factor is in the first quadrant, uh, whereas the second one is in the second quadrant and the projections of the axis are the same or both uh, drift vectors are uh, inside of the first quadrant. Okay, let's split our, uh, I'm gonna call it the angle space. Let's split uh, our angle space according to the behavior of our walks. Uh, this is a little bit a tremendous uh, notation, but I'm gonna explain it very briefly. For example, this theta epsilon one is greater than two, greater than zero, represents the set of all angles where the projection of the first walk on that on that uh, direction 
is greater than the projection of the second walk on that projection for at least epsilon. And the second walk is also for at least epsilon greater, projection of the second walk is also greater than uh, epsilon. When I say walk, I mean here about the uh, drift vectors. And the same idea applies for the all possible cases. So we basically covered all zero to theta, uh, a zero to pi, something very uh, small is uh, left. And more conveniently, uh, we're gonna have spaces of theta one epsilon, theta two epsilon, and theta here epsilon. Um, Colloquially, I'm gonna call them the uh, set angles of the, of the first type, second type, and third type, depending on the uh, corresponding behavior of uh, of random walks. For example, in the in the first set, are all angles where both projections are positive and greater than zero. In the second, one is positive, one is negative, and in the third, uh, both of them are negative. Once again, tremendous notation, but I'm gonna explain it intuitively. So for example, if we consider angles uh, from, he, from this set, uh, theta epsilon one is greater than two, greater than zero, we can expect, since the first projection, first walk has a larger projection than the second walk, we can expect that the maximum of our projection of the random walk of both random walks will be obtained relatively late, will be obtained uh, on the first walk, whereas the minimal projection will be obtained relatively early and it will be obtained on the second walk. And we apply the same logic for all possible cases and we define this event here. Epsilon defines you how much do you stand out from the uh, same projection line? And gamma tells you how early and how late would you like your maximum minimum to happen? And because the intuition that I've just told you, we can expect that this E and Y epsilon gamma is an event of a relatively large probability. Okay. And that's basically the statement of this proposition. This proposition is fundamental pr proposition in, uh, in, this, uh, in this work. And the second claim of this proposition is basically what I've just told you, the E and Y epsilon gamma is an event of large, pro approximately large probability. It turns out to be uh, approximately one as n tends to infinity. And, Furthermore, we have the behavior of this delta and y theta depending on which, uh, on which thetas you are. For example, if we are on the thetas from the uh, set of angles of the first kind, we can explain that uh, the parameterized range functions, it changes just as the change of the e variable projected on the corresponding on the corresponding direction, and the same logic applies in all three cases. Okay. And the next lemma is the connection between the martingale differences sequences and this uh, what we've done, just done uh, earlier. It tells that um, the NOI is well approximated uh, with this term over here because it is less or equal than this sum over here. Um, almost certainly, of course. Um, so why is that so? Why do I say that it, this sum is negligible? But observe there is some, uh, there is some uh, random variable that, is, uh, that will uh, go to zero almost certainly. Uh, this is also something negligible because there is an indicator of uh, some meaningless event. And in, for the uh, third term, we have the Lebesgue measure of the complement of our uh, space theta. Theta is basically the union of these three angles, angle sets. And we construct our uh, angle sets in a form that the angles that are left, it, that is something negligible. 
And finally, we can denote the uh, the uh, the contribution of the first walk to the approximation sum with uh, y i uh, one, and we do the same thing for the uh, second walk. The contribution to the sum is y i two, and we denote the difference between the Martingale square difference term uh, minus the uh, sum of these two contributions. And lemma three tells you that these two W and Y is also in some sense turns to uh, zero. Okay. And with that lemma, you can go back to theorem number one and you can basically prove it. And that's it for my presentation. Here are the references for the, for the, uh, for the work. These are basically the foundation of the work. Um, uh, our work, which was, it, it was done in collaboration with my colleague, Daniela. And uh, it is uh, mainly uh, motivated by the early works uh, made by a professor, Andrew Wade, from the Durham University and his PhD students. And thank you for attention. attention. It's been a pleasure. Any questions? Sorry, sorry. Thanks, Tomislav. Uh, so, uh, are there any questions for Tomislav? We have plenty of time, I guess. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll ask a question. Yeah. So, Please? oh, sorry, yes, I think I <laughs> skipped in front of the queue, but I'll just ask. So, what about, um, so you have this important assumption about the drifts uh, having full rank, so they can't be dependent vectors. So what if what if they were or or maybe even drift zero? Uh, do you know anything about this situation? Yeah. Uh, what what happens? Yeah, thank you. It's a it's a great question, and I have an answer for that uh, for that question. Um, uh, for example, uh, if you have uh, the case where one drift factor is uh, some something uh, different than zero. And the second drift vector is some is is equal to zero. Uh, we did some simulations, and it turns out that the limit uh, is not normal at the end. Okay, yeah, so very interesting. But, yeah, it's very very interesting. And the second possibility is that the rank of these two drift vectors, uh, it's not two; it's equal to one. So basically, it means that they are in the same direction or opposite. Okay, um, in that case, the limit will also be uh, normal, but uh, the, the approach to the proof is a little bit different. It's more similar to the approach that's been made uh, for the case of only one walk. Okay, it's a little bit different, but uh, it is a spec, it, it's, it, it hasn't been done already but uh, we expect that the limit is also normal. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, Jikitsa, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, Tomislav, for the great talk. Uh, also, this question might seem a little bit naive uh, because I'm not well versed in this theory, but the question is basically, uh, have you probably tried or does it exist in the literature the limit behavior of the extremes of, of those processes, are they studied somewhere? Oh. Uh, what do you mean about the extremes? Uh, you... So so you established the CLT. Okay. Uh, what would happen if you take the maxima of those processes per, per certain amount of time, let's say? Uh -huh. So you mean about the maximum maximum uh, perimeter that appears up to time n? You yes. Mean I have to be honest, I haven't seen such a paper. Um, it, I have to consult my uh, mentors. Maybe there is some work uh, about that problem, but it's, it's, a great, it's a great question, but I haven't studied that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, we have two or three minutes, maybe more questions. Okay, maybe one obvious one. Okay, uh, for me, uh, so you did this for perimeter. Uh, would the same techniques be useful for, for example, area or 
And also, is the dimension two really crucial here, or you can do everything in, in D dimension? A great question, Robert. Thank you very much. Um, so currently, we are studying the uh, the behavior of the diameter, diameter, and uh, the the similar approach uh, turns turns out to be uh, applicable. Uh, secondly, uh, the assumption that we consider the uh, the planar box is crucial because uh, R two is the only uh, Euclidean space where the Cauchy formula, both for the perimeter, there is also some uh, formula for the diameter, is um, uh, is applicable because uh, in higher dimensions the the Cauchy formula is. Uh, it doesn't uh, exist anymore. It's it it has totally different meaning. It's a called mean uh, mean uh, parameter uh, length or something like that. It's not uh, the parameter anymore. And thirdly, uh, you asked about the area. Uh, yes, we have some uh, thoughts about we had some thoughts about the the area problem and. It's a little bit different than these two uh, uh, operators that we considered earlier, the perimeter and the diameter, because the area uh, is a little bit different because the area is, uh, let's say, it's not a linear operator in some sense. Uh, so uh, it, it has to be another approach. And I was, when I was thinking about the area, um, it might be approached using the Green's theorem Maybe we could describe the area with some integral uh, uh, around the boundary. Maybe it will uh, it will be good. We will see. Okay, uh, Andre, uh, quick question. Thank you. If there is still time, just to add to the possible extensions, I had the same question as her way to be sincere. But uh, what if you wouldn't have independent uh, random walks? say like sticky Brownian motions the, uh, if the two random walks would not be independent? Hmm. Um, great, great question. Um, hmm. I haven't thought uh, really about the non-independent case. Um, I'm, so I'm not sure what to uh, answer, to be honest. Um, but yeah, maybe something, something else should be done in that case, yeah. Would you have convex hull or... Yes, yeah, so you can consider convex hull, but uh, non-independence is—I uh, don't know how to approach that case to the to the problem. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, 